year 11 biology students welcome to today's e-learning lesson you've already probably flicked through the powerpoint i'm going to go through it with you um just to clarify anything that perhaps was a little bit unclear so adaptations and regulation is this chapter specifically today we're looking at adaptations we've already observed through your biomimicry lesson um, how we have noticed adaptations in nature and adapted them to our humankind benefit in the form of engineering, uh, behavior. There's a lot of different ways in which we have mimicked what's happened in nature. Today, we're just going to be looking at how nature has adapted in order to uh, survive in there and thrive in their environment. So, by the end of the lesson, you should be able to explain how successful adaptations have been used and explain the structural, physiological, behavioral adaptations that enhance an organism's survival and enable life to exist in a wide range of environments. That's the aim of the game for everyone other than us, pretty much, in the whole living organisms on this earth um, to thrive and survive. It should be for us, I know, and times like this, to remind us it is still the main reason for us however um, it doesn't quite come as easy in nature and you can see how many adaptations they have actually gone to and the great lengths that uh, creatures have evolved in order to survive so let's get into it an adaptation firstly is a feature of a living organism that has evolved in response to the various environmental factors that it's exposed to so what are some of these environmental factors? Okay, we have abiotic factors. Um, so biotic, you know, bio is living. So abiotic is non-living factors. So biotic living factors. Non-living factors that are still important in our environment can be things like water, the amount of water, the presence of water, the absence of water in a desert or an ocean, a rainforest, uh, the list goes on and on. The type of water, so the salinity, we call this the salt levels. Um, it's not just simply salt or fresh. I'm just using that to give you an example. There's a whole scale between very salty and very fresh and everywhere in between. But salinity levels is how we measure that. pH level, whether something is acidic or in an acidic environment. Worms in acidic soil, for example or an alkali, which is the opposite to an acid, for example, detergent uh, and washing powder are examples of alkali, so soapy materials or substances. So biotic factors are the living components, okay? So prey and predators, they obviously have a big factor in uh, the survival of an organism. It needs to keep away from its predators and it needs to catch its prey in order to survive and thrive. Competition for territory, that could be within a species, that could be within other species. There's a whole range of issues um, and challenges that each organism faces from that perspective. Finding reproductive partners, which there's some fantastic videos out there of um, in terms of the animal kingdom. Uh, yeah, we'll get into that in a bit, you know, a couple of lessons to come. So. Other things as well, parasites and harmful microorganisms. You could be a big, huge creature, but tiny little microorganisms could be the thing that bring you down, as we're experiencing right now with COVID-19. So presence of fungi, bacteria, plants, thriving natural environment usually means a greater chance of survival for the organisms within it. So. Why do they adapt? Why do they need to adapt? Animals live in extreme environments sometimes. There are little microorganisms that live on vents at the bottom of the ocean. Not a drop of sunlight gets anywhere near there. But they live on the vents and they're able to do chemosynthesis to survive. Access to resources, being able to access nutrients. That is incredibly important and animals will adapt in order to make that easier for themselves. Reproduce. Um, if you can't reproduce, you can't survive. Simple. Defend themselves from predators. Defend their territory. 
um, communicate and interact with their own species, so human language right now that we're partaking in, well, I'm partaking to you, is a great example of that. Um, communicating with other species, for example, a rattlesnake rattling its tail to say, hey, listen here, mofo, you come any closer, I'm going to bite. So that little warning um, is a form of communication. So adaptations. This is the definition, if asked, genetically controlled features that may assist survival and reproduction of organisms in a specific environment. So an adaptation doesn't just occur. I can't just wake up tomorrow and decide to adapt in a structure on my body. This is a genetically controlled thing which occurs over many generations. Structural adaptations physical ad adaptations, physiological, sorry, and behavioral. They're the three strands, the three different types of adaptations. We're going to look at them in a bit more detail right now. So structural adaptations, particular aspects of the structure, so the physical things on the body of an organism, okay? So the body size, the shape, whether it has horns, how long its legs are, how long its neck is, if it's a giraffe, all these type of things are structural. They are uh, elements of its structure which have adapted in order to make something easier in terms of surviving, thriving. So some examples, body coverings. Emperor penguins have four different thick scale-like layers that act as a windproof coat to protect it from the cold winds, which is incredibly important when you live in Antarctica or the Arctic. They also have a thick layer of blubber or fat. A lot of animals that live in those environments have this. Um, and fat acts as insulation. Okay, and that insulation keeps the heat in and keeps the cold out. So it keeps the heat on either side of that blubber. So um, this doesn't just happen in animals, this also happens in leaves and in plants and the plant kingdom. So um, Plants in the desert, they need to reduce the surface area of the leaf because, as you know, photosynthesis uses water as a reactant. So if it has a very large leaf, it's going to lose too much water. So having a smaller leaf means less water is lost through this process. So that's a way it is adapted over time in order to reduce water loss and survive in that difficult desert environment. So another desert environment creature, you can pause and have a read through these adaptations. These are all structural adaptations of the cacti. So have a read through that now. Physiological adaptations. Okay, these ones are slightly different and they're easy to confuse with the structural. Uh, so the structural adaptations, as I said, body shape, horns shape of the face, shape of the eyes, shape of the ears, all those type of things, okay? Whereas physiological are particular aspects of the function, so how that organism functions, and they're usually physiological process or chemical process that occurs in order to help them adapt. So camouflage is a very good example of that. An octopus changing its color and texture to match its underwater environment so that it blends in with surroundings. So it can load over to your living room couch if it was underwater and change to the color of that couch. So that changing process is a result um, of adaptive camouflage and it's a chemical process that occurs in color changing cells called chromatophores. So this is something that happens um, and can change based on the chemicals that it releases. Incredibly high level adaptation there. So that's not to be confused with um, structural camouflage, for example, in a pattern on a leopard. That doesn't change. Okay, that's not a physiological process that changes in a chemical process. Um, that is the structure that is on the pattern of that animal. So watch this video um, of a cuttlefish. An incredible cuttlefish um, trying to mimic some very difficult, um, trying to camouflage, sorry, some very difficult uh, backgrounds and doing a pretty good job of it. Um, here is another physiological 
uh, adaptation. Some fish that inhabit very cold water, um, will, they will die if their blood freezes. So they have antifreeze proteins, similar to those produced by plants, which circulate in the blood of the fish and prevent the growth of ice crystals. If its blood freezes, its heart will stop, it will be dead. So having these antifreeze proteins gives it an adaptation that allows it to survive in cold waters that otherwise, without that adaptation, it wouldn't have. This is my favorite. Please click on that video because uh, this thing has managed to adapt so that it has a light, maybe 30 centimeters in front of its mouth, swimming at the round of the depths of the oceans, the anglerfish, um, not having to work very hard for food at all, just turn the light on um, by bioluminescence, which is also a video on, um, which is a chemical process in where it can produce light, as you can see in that photo, and producing that light um, allows it to attract prey right in front of its mouth. Could not be any easier than that. So behavioral adaptations, the last one. Uh, behavior adaptations are activities that an animal performs in response to internal and external stimuli. Now, remember, stimuli is something um, in the environment. External and stimuli is something in the environment which causes it to act um, in a particular way for a behavioral. Internal, uh, a change internal. So, for example, overheating um, would be uh, internal. Uh, stimuli that it's reacting to. All right, so some examples are uh, seeking or leaving shelter. All right, in, if it's hot, finding shade, physically going there is some shade over there, walking over to it um, and being in the shade in order to cool down. That is a behavioral adaptation. Likewise, if it's very cold, cold blooded animals in particular, reptiles, um, snakes, they will find heat. They will find a hot rock to lay on and, and soak up as much of that heat as they can in order to keep themselves alive and well. So that is behavioral adaptation. A dog panting. Um, and the, the method of the panting is to cool down the body by evaporated cooling. So by allowing the heat out of the dog's mouth and on the dog's tongue to evaporate off, Pulls down the body temperature of the dog, okay, which is again a behavioral adaptation. Huddling, another example, body warmth, creating an insulation, a group insulation. That is a behavior. They need to perform that. It doesn't just happen from one doing it by itself. They all need to partake in that behavior. Um, this doesn't just happen in animals. We also have plants. So tropism is plant growth in response to environmental factor. Okay, so plants will grow either positive tropism, which is where the plant grows towards a stimulus that is positive for its growth. For example, if there's water, um, its roots will reach out to that water. That is positive tropism. Um, and likewise, if there's light, it will grow its leaves towards the light um, in order to increase that growth, you know, like a rainforest. Um, but it can also grow away from a stimulus, which is negative tropism. And the reason being for that is, for example, in the desert again, um, if it's too hot and it's losing too much water, then it will grow uh, in a direction away from that extreme heat in order to protect itself from too much water loss. Okay, watch these videos of the polar bear. I'm going to pause this. I would suggest that you pause this and watch those two videos. Okay, so some adaptations. There they are listed there. Small ears. Um, helps reduce heat loss. So this is the reason for each adaptation, taking a little bit further. Okay, we know what the adaptation is. Why? Why, why does it have that adaptation? Thick, greasy fur, insulation. White fur, camouflage from prey. Large feet to spread body weight across the snow. If it had only a small um, point of contact, it would probably go uh, through the ice. So by spreading out the pores over a larger surface area, 
it spreads out the weight and less likely to go through. Uh, black skin absorbs any heat transmitted through the hair. Okay, and uh, body surface area is small. We already know this importance of surface area to volume ratio. So, camels. Let's play on these ones here. Press pause. All right, and then we have the kangaroo rat. Again, watch the video, and you can see these advantages as well. So, again, press pause to read through those in a little bit more detail. Right. Now we have the great white, the hunting thing or one off of the ocean up there with the orca whale. Um, but this again, generations and generations of adaptation. So there's some other strange ones. This is speaking of strange ones. Have a watch of this video. This is the evolution and the amount of adaptations and the reasons for those adaptations of genitalia in the animal kingdom, of which you would think they all have fairly similar genitalia, similar to ours, of a male and a female human being, could not be further from the truth. So I strongly suggest you have a watch of that. Very interesting. All right, and this is the activity I'd like you to complete today. So have a go at that and shoot me if you have any questions. Bye.